Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, delighted to be sharing with you our iThrive Grids webinar today to think about how we can work together to develop a shared decision-making tool that will have application for integrated care systems. Um, so we're really pleased to be welcoming to you, you to this National iThrive Programme webinar. And I just, while people are joining, I'm just going to go through some of the um, housekeeping context for, for this webinar. And um, so you, my name's Rachel James, that's why we put that there because I often forget to introduce myself. So um, yeah, I'm the Clinical and Programme Director for the National iThrive Programme, which is the programme that supports sites across the country in implementing the Thrive Framework for System Change. So I'm hoping that's what you're expected to be joining, a, a workshop to be thinking about how you make the iThrive grids, which are a shared decision-making tool developed through the programme applicable to integrated care systems. You will have seen as you joined the webinar just now that the webinar is being recorded. And um, we're, what we will be doing is uploading it onto our website. So if the content of it um, you think could be useful to your colleagues, you're very welcome to share that. Um, but of course, to help with the um, recording, if you could keep your camera turned off and mute yourself um, until we do some of the group activities or you want to ask a question, that'd be really helpful. Um, if there are any technical issues, please do use the chat function. It will be monitored by a member of the national team and we'll be able to attend to that as soon as, as, soon as possible. If you have any questions or reflections on the content of the presentation, please do submit those during the chat function during the course of the webinar. And if there's a particular person that you would like to address it to, then um, please state that just to help us be able to uh, respond in a timely way. And if you choose to, you can submit um, your comment or um, question anonymously. Um, so you just click on, on uh, the buttons when you're adding to the chat. We will be sending all the slides out to everybody who's participated today. Um, and as I mentioned, there'll be the recording as well. So we'll send you the link to that once we've uploaded it. If you have any questions or reflections that you would like to share following the webinar, please do feel free to send them to the National iThrive Programme team and our email um, address for doing that is there, iThriveInfo at Tavi Port. What we'll also do is pop that in the chat so you can just have a, a direct link to it as well. Okay, so uh, just to give a summary of the outline for today's webinar, we're going to start uh, with um, Nikita Sopel, who is joining us from NHSE, actually we should have included that, sorry, Nikita, um, from NHS England, who is working with the personalisation team there, particularly around personal health budgets, and so she's going to be setting the scene for us in relation to the context of personalization and shared decision making aligned with the ambitions of the NHS long term plan, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, and set that context for the development of the iThrive grids, which Rosa will then be continuing um, on from Nikita. And Rosa Town is an assistant psychologist who's also um, undertaken a PhD around in the personalization remit, and she'll be sharing how within the National iPad programme she's very much supported the development of the grids. Um, and the grids were set up um, or developed a number of years ago now and that was in a, a very different context even thinking about five years when the, the thought of developing the tools um, first originated and we've, we're very mindful of some of the feedback we've received uh, about the grids and hence thinking together with, with your colleagues from across the system today in how we can work together to think about how we make the grids most applicable for the integrated care systems that we're working within now. And so the second part of the afternoon is very much focused on working together to do that through um, different activities, which we will come on to and explain. We will take a brief comfort break in, um, in between the overview and then moving into the, the workshops. And I hope that um, you all managed to stay for the workshop because that's the bit where actually it will really come to life, both for yourselves and also in terms of the um, um, adjustments we might all agree to make to the, to the grids to make them fit for the very different landscape we're now working within. And we will be 
aiming to close for four, four o'clock promptly. So um, I will now hand over to Nikita to set the context for personalization and shared decision making. Thanks, Nikita. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> Hello, my name's Nikita. So I work with the personal health budgets team at NHS England and NHS Improvement. So today I'm going to talk about personalised care and about its relevance to the Thrive Framework. So next slide, please. So this slide shows what personalised care means to people. So traditionally people have been seen as patients with symptoms or conditions that need to be treated. However, with personalised care, it's about being seen as a whole person. So valuing the person for their skills and their strengths in addition to their needs. So instead of clinicians being considered as the experts, it's more about that equal partnership approach with both the person and the clinician being considered as equals and sharing that power. So personalised care means that people are no longer told what's wrong with them. They're being asked what matters to you and they're supported to have the information they need to make informed decisions and become active partners in conversations about their own health and their well-being. So next slide. So this slide is the comprehensive model for personalised care from the NHS. And universal personalised care is an all age whole population model with six components. So the six components are shared decision making, enabling choice, including legal rights to choice, social prescribing and community based support, supported self management, personalised care and support planning and personal health budgets and integrated personal budgets. And this diagram shows the personalised care triangle. So right at the bottom, the widest part of the triangle, the whole population should have access to shared decision making choice and social prescribing, including community based support. So that means people should be supported to stay well and make informed decisions when their health changes. And then in the middle of the triangle, we've got around 30% of the population. And these are people who are experiencing long term physical and mental health conditions. And people should have access to personalised care and support planning and be supported to self manage by increasing patient activation through health coaching, peer support and education. So these people at the middle of the triangle should be supported to build the knowledge, skills and confidence to live well with their condition. And then at the very top of the triangle, we've got around 5% of the population who have complex needs. And the people at the top of the triangle require specialist support. And this could include the provision of a personal health budget or integrated personal budget to ensure they're able to access the things they need to meet the outcomes that they want to achieve. So a personal health budget is the culmination of all of the six elements of the personalised care model. And a personal health budget could be provided where it's evident the person has needs that could be met in a more creative, personalised way, or there's goods and services outside of the commissioned ones that could improve outcomes for people and their families and carers. Next slide, please. So this slide is pretty similar. Um, but it shows the Thrive framework and how it aligns with the comprehensive model for personalised care. So at the bottom of the triangle again, um, we'd expect that across the population of children and young people, around 80% of the population would be thriving. So to enable the whole population to thrive, you'd need a comprehensive prevention and promotion resources in place. And this fits within the personalised care agenda as part of the universal offer. So supporting people to stay well, build community resilience and enabling people to make informed decisions and choices when their health changes. And then within the comprehensive model for personalised care, the getting advice and signposting and getting help needs based groupings align very much with the target offer. So this is about supporting people to build knowledge, skills and confidence and to live well with their health condition as required. And the getting more help and getting risk support needs based groupings align clearly with the more specialist interventions right at the top of the triangle. So this might be provided through personal health budgets or PHBs. 
And here, PHB is all about empowering service users and integrating care and reducing the requirement for unplanned service use. So you can see within these needs-based groupings of the Thrive framework, there's a genuine alignment with the comprehensive model for personalised care. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the operating model of personalised care. And it's another way of showing how all of the six components of personalised care and NHS at home work together. So personal health budgets are one of those components. For anybody who's unfamiliar with personal health budget, a personal health budget or PHB enables money to be allocated and spent on something that's important to a person. So it's something the person has identified as something that matters to them and will help them towards their own health and wellbeing needs in partnership with their local healthcare team. So on the next slide, there's just some key words that have been used to describe personal health budgets. So you can see, you know, it comes up really high independence, choice, freedom, consistency, control, personalised flexibility. So lots of positive words associated with personal health budgets. So on the next slide, um, we so going back to the, the triangle, so when we talked about 80% of the population who'd be thriving with comprehensive prevention and promotion resources in place, there's a couple of, of examples here from the Looked After Children with Mental Health Support Needs Demonstrator Project. So the report came out in 2020, which found that looked after children responded well to a personalised approach and social model where they felt heard and listened to. So the first example is a young person who used the personal health budget was over the moon. They dropped three dress sizes and started other keep fit classes at the gym. And they were promoted at work and greatly reduced their substance misuse and stopped all medication for depression and anxiety, which is great. And then the second case example is a young person who was assaulted, which led them to experiencing depression and anxiety. And they went to their GP who had referred them for IAPT, which is improving access to psychological therapies. But there was a three month wait list. So then the social worker referred them for personal care and support planning. And it was agreed the young person would use a personal health budget for singing lessons. And from accessing those singing lessons, the young person decided they didn't want IAPT or they didn't need it anymore. They really felt that the singing had helped them to manage their mental health. Next slide, please. So Islington's five year transformation plan had consulted with young people, families and professionals to establish what young people wanted and needed from mental health and wellbeing services. And young people requested wellbeing services at all levels of need. So that included early intervention for emerging low wellbeing. And they wanted the service to be rooted in existing community youth provision as this is where they'd already had connections, kept well and felt safe. So the role of the emotional wellbeing worker is to provide a non-clinical service to address multi-moderate wellbeing needs through a community and youth work approach. And this emphasises the wellbeing benefits of creative, sporting and social activities in the immediate community. So the emotional wellbeing workers work alongside young people to discover their interests, passions and goals and to find activities suited to this. And the aim is to support young people to become motivated, positive and resilient and to develop self-help skills to get them where they want to be positively, develop relationships with friends and family, gain the confidence to experiment and also to make mistakes and thrive, improving their ability to manage and face the challenges to get them ready for the world of work as well for those that are a bit older, so over 16. And the use of personalised care and support planning, social prescribing and link working, and also personal health budgets resonated really strongly with the aims of the project as emotional wellbeing workers work in a personalised way with young people. And the service aligns closely to the Thrive Frameworks, getting advice and signposting and getting help needs based groupings and core elements of the personalised care model, including personalised care support planning, social prescribing and personal health budgets. 
And here you can see a really yummy example. So that's a ba baking example um, where the emotional wellbeing team supported a young person to access free online baking classes during the first lockdown. Um, and the person won a competition and the young person wanted to continue this new passion at home, but lacked some key equipment. And a personal health budget request was carefully considered. Um, the young person had a history of disordered eating, but it was felt that after conversations between CAM, so Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services and the family, it was agreed it would be a really supportive step for the young person and for their family. So that's some really positive feedback. Um, and if you can't read the message, it says thank you so much for recommending the baking thing. Thank you. I won half a dozen red velvet cupcakes. And how did you find baking for the first time? And there's a picture. And the next slide is, um, so this is actually a, a video that will be shared, but just to provide some context. So Thurrock identified an issue within their child and adolescent mental health services, where children and young people aged 14 and above were remaining on therapist caseloads for longer than clinically necessary. And it was largely due, due to clinicians' concerns about children and young people being more vulnerable and subject to re-referral once discharged from CAMS. So thorough CAMS were experiencing high demand and long waiting times for this service and wanted to take appropriate action to increase flow through services. And um, Thurrock's personal health budget offer recruited a local mind employed worker based within their local CAMS provision. And this worker develops a personalised care and support plan in conjunction with the child and young person, their family, their carers, and also the CAMS clinical staff, really focusing on meeting the identified health needs. And also this community assets approach enables the child and young person to be matched with local provision where it exists, and also to be supported by the mind worker to access any additional resources that don't exist through a personal health budget. If you want to play the video now, that'd be great. Knowing that I was coming to the end of my CAMS journey, it was quite daunting at first because I didn't think there'd be any other help there. Thorough CAM services were experiencing high demand and long waiting times for their services and we were keen as commissioners to look at ways to help them face that challenge. One of the things we found was that clinicians felt that they were holding on to uh, young people into the service and not discharging them. My worry as a clinician was where are young people going to go? You know, they're working with us, you build a relationship, you build a rapport, you put your heart and soul into the job to be fair. And knowing however that there's more need out there, there's more young people that need our services. So you're kind of balancing all of the time, you know, when do you discharge, when's the right time to discharge. So we wanted to find a way of really supporting young people as they transition from the service and move out in the, into the community. It was very important that we developed a person-centred approach and wanted to offer personal health budgets as part of that offer. We developed a business case that was presented to the Collaborative Commissioning Forum in Essex, which was supported and implemented last year. Kieran, hello. 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 Hi. Is this Paula told you about me? Yes. I'm the Youth Facilitator for Positive Pathways. Nice to meet you. At Thorough and Brentwood Mind, we've employed a Youth Facilitator to work within the CAMS team locally. And her role is really to meet with young people, their parents, carers, and the therapists, and to look at what their interests are and what they hope to achieve. So it's really a social prescribing model. Hi, my name's Kiran. I'm the youth facilitator for Positive Pathways, and I work for Thurrock Mind to help young people transition back into the community through offering them extra support. There are four stages to the process. The first stage is a CAMS worker and a Minds Youth facilitator have a pre-discharge meeting with the young person and family. So why don't you tell me about a few things, uh, some interests that you might have that I could maybe, you know, just to get to know you so I can see where I can help you. 
The second stage is a personalised care and support plan session with a mind worker and um, takes place with the young person and family. When we first met Kieran, it was after one of Lily's counselling sessions. She got introduced to us to help Lily do things like on the other side of counselling and she's given me lots and lots of information for the help that's also out there for me. What kind of things have helped you so far then? Because we've done quite a few things together, haven't we? Like the counselling, like just talking to all different people, like just... The, the music school as well. Yeah. It's just helped me boost my confidence, like that's the main thing. Third stage, the Mind You facilitator sees what's available in the community to meet the needs of the care plan and to support the young person. As part of Young People's Personalised Care Plan, I introduced them to other organisations in Thurrock, such as Thurrock Mind, Prince's Trust, Inspire Youth, Open Door, Peer Mentoring and Temple Springs, the music school. And I walked them down to the organisation to introduce them to the services. Stage four is the personal health budget, which is used for young person's needs where there isn't an available community service already identified. And now you've got your own little circle of friends and, you know, like my... Joe shared his interest in music and how he wasn't able to access that in college. So I applied for a personal uh, health budget and uh, so he managed to get 12 paid sessions for one-to-one -one tutoring for keyboard lessons. Oh, it's boosted my confidence immensely. I can now actually be confident in going up the stages. Joe's never ever picked a career. He didn't know what he wanted to do. But music, I know that he really enjoys and he loves to do it. And I hopefully by this, he can do that. Ellie, Ellie, uh, when I first met with her, she shared about the lack of the social groups that she struggled with. So part of my work was making groups and it really helped her uh, meet new friends. She brought me places um, like Temple Springs where I got offered a job and it's given me the opportunity to grow more in myself that I wouldn't have had otherwise. We are really proud of the work that's being carried out here from our CAM services and MIND working in partnership with wider stakeholders across Thurrock. It's been really exciting to see their relationship grow and flourish with new ideas coming out every time we meet. The best thing about the whole project is just opening up. It's almost like we've had French windows put into the clinic and suddenly we can see the outside community and we can see all the resources that are available there. 40 young people have been through the system so far, only six of which have actually required a personal health budget to support their personalised plan. This really reflects the amount of resource and opportunities there are out there in the community for young people in Thurrock. I know now that I'm very confident when I discharge somebody, there's something else out there for them. There's an, another kind of plan of care. I really enjoy my work, supporting young people, seeing them flourish. It's almost as if I'm walking alongside them on their journey. Like she's an angel in disguise for us. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily I had Kieran and the Positive Pathways worker there to give me more guidance and support that I needed. So hopefully that um, shows the benefits of the personalised care support planning approach and personal health budgets in Thurrock. So the next slide, I don't know if we can get that up. Um, so, so this one, I won't go into too much detail just because I'm mindful of time, um, but it's a young, so a child age seven, it's an autistic child that's had a range of professionals and organisations involved in their care and during their personalised care and support planning they were placed on a child protection plan and spent some time in foster care um, so it's quite a complex case but basically through the personalised care support planning process and through a personal health budget this person was supported to access a therapeutic farm placement and um, to, to be able to access tennis lessons and have a home trampoline and other equipment and an activity voucher, which was really positive for them. It had a, a huge positive impact for that 
person for that child for their family um mum was better able to cope at home and was offered support and subsequently the child was taken off the child protection register and their challenging behavior or you know the behavior that was considered as challenging had reduced so it was quite a positive outcome from that and that obviously aligns with um this part of the thrive framework as well getting more help and getting risk support so it just shows the the breadth of the personalized care and support planning approach and how beneficial it is across all areas so the next slide is just a, a quick introduce introduction to a piece of work by the Race Equality Foundation to show how personal health budgets can empower individuals. So this really fits in with the personalised care model. So within mental health, we know that there's some barriers faced by people accessing mental health services. So this includes people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. And that's for many reasons, including but not limited to systematic um, systemic racism. And personal health budgets can be part of a holistic package to support a person's needs, including their mental health. And voluntary sector organisations can play a positive role in engaging people who might have had negative experiences of the NHS. And one of the key findings of this work was the importance of partnership working between the NHS and the voluntary and third sector. So the next slide, so this is a really brief summary of the learning from the Race Quality Foundation report that I've just discussed. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but basically the, the columns they go across and one of the, the learning is around reflecting about personal health budgets being a life changing option for people, including people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds who might not have had positive experiences. So just remembering to think of intersectionality when people are stepping down. So, for example, from inpatient to community mental health services and to respond by creating clear communication, for example, in different languages and different formats such as digital. Um, the next slide is about shared decision making. So shared decision making is absolutely central to personalised care and it's also a key principle of the Thrive framework and being actively engaged equals improved outcomes. And this one page profile tool to support shared decision making is part of the personalised care and support planning which should take place after the clinician and young person have had a personalised what matters to me conversation. And um, so these are all of the, the different areas. So, for example, the pink shows who are the most important people in your life and how often do you see them and what do you like to do together? So just having that really personalised approach. Um, and this template, along with many others, are available on the future NHS platform. So if you move on to the next slide. So this just to show if you haven't joined already, the Future NHS platform has a lot of different workspaces. Um, one of the workspaces is personalised care. So you can join to be a member if you just Google Future NHS. And then within the personalised care workspace, you can access personal health budgets. Um, and there's lots of case studies. So the case studies that we've covered today and lots, lots more, and also some resources resources such as the shared decision making tool and lots of others that you can use in your areas but also adapt as you need to. Um, on the next slide, so these are community of practice events that we're currently running in NHS England and NHS Improvement, particularly around personal health budgets but looking at the personalised care model um, and the different aspects of it. So we have one coming up on Tuesday the 16th between 10 and 11.30. Um, you, you know, you're more than welcome to join the um, webinars. They're recorded. So if you are a future NHS platform member or if you're going to become one, it's a great way of accessing those recordings and all of the resources. Uh, and then finally, the next slide. So. Um, whoever is supporting a child or young person with mental health and well-being needs should at the very least know where to signpost to and understand what the range of help and support options are available in their locality. 
And within the Thrive Framework and the Personal Health Budget Agenda, proactive prevention and promotion is fundamental in enabling whole communities to support mental health and well-being, including the most vulnerable and targeted populations. And the voice of children, young people and their families is always central. So the shared decision making process of choosing the type of help or support option according to a needs based grouping is fundamental. And the I Thrive grids that we'll be focusing on today are a tool that the national team have developed to support shared decision making. And I think I'm handing over to Rosa. Thanks very much, Nikita. You are indeed. And I think um, a huge thank you to you for setting that scene um, for us all in terms of really thinking about that shift in the relationship between the professional working with the children and young people and ensuring that um, there is genuine active shared decision making for those reasons you've outlined. So, yes, I'll hand over to Rosa now to help everyone understand the development of the grids and move on to the workshop activity for this afternoon. So thanks very much to you both. Great, thanks Rachel and thanks Nikita. That leads really well into talking about the development of the iThrive grids. Um, so for those who uh, who joined a little bit later, I'll just introduce myself again. So in case you're wondering who I am. Um, so my name is Rosa Town. I'm an assistant psychologist uh, working with the iThrive team. And I was involved in the development of the iThrive Grids. So some of you may have already attended an iThrive Grids training. Um, don't worry, this isn't going to be all of the same information. It may be just a bit of a refresher, some of it. Um, but really what we're hoping to do today is to look at the iThrive Grids and think about how they can be improved to better sort of reflect the, the landscape, the, the way things are now. Because these were developed back in 2017, or originally actually back in 2016, and then first, you know, sort of piloted in 2017. And uh, we're aware that some of the distinctions on the grids don't really reflect the way that sort of health and care landscape looks at the minute. So we could really use your help with this today during this workshop. But um, anyway, just to uh, sort of start off with uh, talking about the grids, uh, I wanted to mention, you know, Nikita's already talked about shared decision-making and this is one of those definitions that you've probably come across before, at least seen before. So shared decision-making can be thought of as a process in which clinicians and patients work together to select tests, treatments, management, or support packages based on clinical evidence and the patient's informed preferences. And um, if we go on to the next slide. So it, I think it's quite helpful to think about shared decision-making as kind of something that lies on this continuum here. So uh, on the far left, we've got clinician decision, and this could be thought of as like this sort of more paternalistic model of healthcare, which is sort of doctor knows best. And then on the consumer choice side, on the far uh, right side, that's where the consumer is informed about what they can do next, and then they have the ultimate uh, choice about what to do. So um, a consumer, obviously this is kind of more US style phrasing, but we're thinking of, of service users here. Um, and shared decision-making really lies in the middle of these, of these two. And I think there's sometimes a misunderstanding that engaging a young person or a parent in a shared decision-making process is sort of giving them the ultimate choice over a decision, which can be a little bit alarming, especially if you're concerned about risk or um, other aspects of that person's care. But really, shared decision-making is a conversation, and uh, it's where the professional and the service user work together to do things like clarify treatment goals, share information about options and preferred outcomes. And then the aim of the sort of outcome of a shared decision-making process is for there to be mutual agreement on the best course of action to take forward. So that includes the clinical uh, or the clinician or the professional's expertise, as well as the young person and family members' uh, experience, preferences, needs. Um, so it's very much shared in that way. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, some sort, sort of obvious reasons, I think, why shared decision-making is important, but um, I think it's good to sort of cover these because um, we do talk about shared decision-making, but we don't always say, you know, why, why are we engaging young people in, in shared decision-making? Why is this important? Well, we know from some of the recent research into shared decision-making that young people want to be involved in decisions about their treatment or care. And this keeps com coming up in multiple policy documents that sort of rely on workshops with young people and parents over and over again, people are saying they want to be involved in this, uh, in this process. 
And uh, being involved in shared decision making can promote agency, which can lead to a number of positive outcomes, both sort of therapeutic, but also just um, quality of life type things. Um, it can facilitate engagement in uh, not only in sort of the treatment uh, option that's that's chosen, but sort of in treatment in general uh, and sort of engaging with the, um, the different support systems around a young person and a family. Um, policy in the UK, like I mentioned, supports shared decision making. So you've probably, if, you, if you've seen the term before, you, you may have seen it in policy documents like the NHS long-term plan in Future in Mind. The, the list goes on. Basically, most of the major, the green paper, most of the major sort of documents that have come out in the last 10 years or so have mentioned shared decision making in one way or another. Um, and it also, shared decision making allows for a wide range of options to be discussed, which can reduce any sort of unconscious um, practitioner bias. If, for instance, practitioners would work in shared decision making, or rather in um, cognitive behavioral therapy or something like that, they might be more likely to recommend that to, to young people. And instead, having this process, you can discuss the, the, the available options, even if they're not available within a particular service or setting, uh, and think about kind of what, what are the young person and parents' needs and how can they access um, the right support for them. Um, and then finally, it facilitates an opportunity for open discussion across the system, which I think has become more and more important as we move toward this sort of integrated care systems and also as we implement the, um, the Thrive framework across different settings. Um, so moving on to the next slide, uh, just one uh, interesting uh, sort of, it's interesting to me as a researcher, but um, that one of the things that I've come across is uh, this discrepancy in stakeholder views in terms of shared decision making. So often when I, so one of the things that I do is deliver the shared decision making training to professionals. And one of the things that professionals often say is I, I already engage young people in shared decision making. I, I present the options. I tell them, you know, what, I, I share my clinical expertise and, and we have a discussion. And that's ve very likely the case. Um, but it's quite interesting that in, for instance, in this audit uh, in 2015, which was looking at CYP IAPT uh, services uh, in, in the UK, um, there was a discrepancy in, in views that was reflected. So while clin clinicians felt that they um, had, so 83% of the clinicians surveyed in this uh, audit reported having usually or always discussed the range of treatment options available with service users over the last two weeks, young people and parents, it was only 30% of young people who felt that they were actually given enough information to make a choice about the treatment they received. And only 50% of parents in that case uh, felt the same. So um, this is interesting because I think it represents that while, while professionals are trying to engage young people and parents or carers in shared decision making, that often parents and, and carers and young people don't feel like they're necessarily given enough information to, to be involved. Um, so moving on to the next slide. So in kind of a, a direct response to that um, and looking into kind of the, the literature that's around um, sort of the research that's around shared decision making, um, the iThrive grids, which are a, um, which are, a, they're a paper-based, well, they're now available on PDFs, but they're, um, they're a shared decision-making tool called a decision aid. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into why the decision aids are, are necessary on the next slide. Um, but just to describe the grids to you really quickly, um, they have been co-produced uh, with young people, parents, and professionals. There's eight of them right now. They uh, aim to help young people, their families, and a professional compare alternative treatment or support options and come to a shared decision. Um, and they cover common help or support options and FAQs, and those were developed by uh, young people, parents, and clinicians who were involved in the expert reference groups creating these uh, grids. So uh, there, like I said, there's eight grids total. They cover different presenting difficulties. And as of right now, they're separated by uh, helper support available in NHS and helper support available outside of the NHS. But like I said, this is going to be the focus of, of our activity later is thinking about, is there a better way to, to describe these distinctions between different types of helper support? Um, and just to say too, that the grids are NICE endorsed, which means that NICE, uh, their endorsement team has looked at the guidance on the grids and confirmed that it aligns with, with, their, with their guidance. Um, so, uh, and, and to say too as well, that what that means is for the NICE endorsed grids, which I think is, is most of the grids now, um, because most of them include NICE guidance on them. We keep the front of the grids, uh, the, the type of um, 
the content within the grids themselves we keep that standardized um, so that we can maintain that endorsement but on the reverse of the grids there's actually a space for um, thinking about different types of locally available help or support that sort of fits into those categories on the front of the grids. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so I mentioned that young people want to be involved in decisions about their care and the reason for sort of choosing these decision aids is because they've uh, been shown to be one of the most effective ways of promoting shared decision making and sort of reducing that stakeholder discrepancy and involving and their, thereby in, involving young people and parents in, in, in decisions about their treatment or care. And they have a number of positive outcomes. I won't read through all of these but um, and it's just to say, too, the i grids are, are one tool to promote shared decision making. Nikita mentioned another tool there, which looks really great. So they're just one way really to facilitate that conversation um, and to ensure that, um, that young people and parents in particular have enough information to sort of have these kinds of conversations within these sessions, which are, we know are time limited and often there's a lot being discussed and a lot going on. So, um, so moving on to the next slide. All right, so continuing on with the with the other positive effects of, of, uh, of, of decision aids, and we also know that um, shared decision making and personalization are core ambitions of the NHS long term plans so that's additional um, sort of planning policy type documents that that support shared decision making and, and, and personalization so that's one of the reasons why. There's been an appetite in the ITHRA grids training and why we've been we've been delivering this because um, we uh, many services and locations want to improve uh, shared decision making and it's also a core part of, of the thrive framework as well. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the grids just give you a really brief introduction to them if you haven't actually seen them, because I think talking about them, you can sort of get an idea of what they might look like, but I think it's most useful to actually see them um, in person so. This is the in NHS I thrive grid for low mood. Um, and you'll see across the top of the grid, you've got in those little circles, you've got the different support or help options there. And then along the left side of the grid in the in the far left column, you've got the common questions uh, about those different types of help or support options. And then within the body of the grid are our answers to those questions. And just to say sort of up top as well that these grids are not meant to be standalone or to be used um, sort of as a replacement for treatment or for therapy or anything like that. They're, they're very much meant to be a jumping off point as part of the conversation with, uh, with young people and parents and family members. So that's why we deliver this training uh, among other reasons uh, to clinicians so that they can use the grids um, meaningfully within, within the sessions themselves and also um, that's that's why the grids don't have you know they, they can only contain so much information so they have just enough on there to get the conversation going to answer maybe a few questions but um absolutely to be used with a professional uh there um so moving on to the next one this is the reverse of the in nhs i throat grid it's got the references on here it's got uh some information about side effects how common what what it means to say that something's common uncommon etc and then the next one is the out of NHS I throw grid for low mood. So these are the types of uh, treatment help support that you can get. Um, originally, the idea was sort of more community based type things or voluntary third sector type um, things. And so again, it's, it's organized exactly the same way. Common questions on the left, support across the top. And then if you go to the next page, these ones have a support list on the back at the top. So these are um, the, the, some, well, this one is kind of the, the national version. Um, so it has some specific types of, for instance, uh, reading support, peer community support. Um, but what we've ended up doing is for um, several of the localities that we that the IPRF team has been working with, um, we have edited this with, with them to make sure that it's relevant to their uh, local area. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, in terms of piloting the grids. So once we had developed these grids, we, we wanted to actually use them in, a, um, in an NHS clinic. So they were piloted um, in 2017 in a CAMS assessment clinic. And some of the learning from that experience, um, it was helpful to have a researcher embedded because that, that was me, the researcher that was embedded in the clinic, because I was able to liaise with the clinicians and collect um, 
to, to collect uh, sort of outcome data as well, because anytime you're changing practice like this, it can be difficult to sort of get that moving without somebody sort of physically on the ground there. Um, there, it was important to have close liaison with admin and informatics. We did some quality improvement things. So we had plan, do, study, act um, cycles, which I really recommend if you're interested in quality improvement, using these to measure sort of incremental change and seeing sort of what, what you do, what effect it has on, on, on whatever outcome you're interested in. Um, the, we, we, it was important that the tool was readily available. So what we ended up doing was, was making it in a PDF format and distributing it to tr clinicians who had been trained to use the grid um, so they could print it off at any time. We had, um, you said we did posters, that's another sort of quality improvement technique. Um, and then we also developed an, a training which could be delivered and also an ongoing support for sites that had received that training as well. So moving on to the next one. Some of the findings from the pilot of the grid. So uh, these are some of the qualitative findings. Um, so in general, people, they were really positively received by both clinicians and uh, parents. In this case, it, we only had feedback from parents because it was a very small pilot. But um, one parent, for instance, explained the grid gives you more. You can go into meetings, the appointment armed with some knowledge. And uh, another parent explained, in fact, I felt my partner and I were able to take ownership of the decision. Um, clinicians uh, felt like, for instance, having the grids allowed them to have quite a, quite a bit of conversation about different types of medication, um, which uh, they found helpful. And then uh, finally, this clinician explained that I think that what they were, that what I was struck by is that the family specifically requested for more grids. The dad wanted a grid, and I thought that this was indicative that it was something that they thought was a useful component of the conversation we had. Um, and then on the next slide, um, in terms of the implementation of the grids, there it was it was tricky at first because I think, uh, as this clinician said, uh, when you're already feeling very full, it's hard to have these to add. Um, and interestingly, something that's been uh, measured with decision aids in the past is is if they actually significantly add time to the consultation. So if they sort of take up more time or make the consultation longer or the assessment longer. And there actually isn't any evidence that they do. So I think in this case, um, it, it, while they were sort of difficult to add at the beginning, they didn't necessarily sort of negatively affect the, the assessment in any particular way. Um, and uh, this clinician explained that this doesn't replace everything else. No one's telling you you actually have to use it. It's a tool to have and actually the family might find it helpful. So in this case, I think it, it, it's important to say that the grids, obviously they don't cover every presenting difficulty. They've been developed for young people aged 11 to 25. So um, they may not you know, fit, fit in sort of, sorry, 11 to 18, not 11 to 25, 11 to 18. Uh, and they may not necessarily be appropriate for you know, someone, one 11 year old, and they might be appropriate for another 11 year old. So it's completely at the, the discretion of the clinician if they wanna use the grids, if they think they might be helpful for facilitating that shared decision-making conversation. Um, and then also to have them electronically, which we now have them available in that format. Um, and moving on to the next one, uh, we did manage to get some feedback from young people about the grids once they've been developed. We obviously in the process of, uh, of developing the grids, uh, young people were involved in that. But then after the grids were piloted, we were sort of needing some feedback from young people about what they thought about them. So these are from young people involved with uh, a CAMS service, a CAMS clinic. Um, so these young people explained that they felt that the grids were clean and that the information was clear and young people friendly. One young person said they liked the images. Uh, as an older young person, they didn't find them excluding. Um, and then various other positive comments too, so that there was enough information. Um, it was important to keep them up to date. Uh, interestingly, this young person explained, I've, I've been missing something like this. I access support at X, X location and they would benefit from this. It's good to have a clear list to help me decide from. And absolutely in the development of these grids, that was one of the main sort of takeaways for us as researchers as well too, is that um, the grids are, the, the, the young people that we spoke to would almost always say, why didn't I have something like this when I went to CAMS or why didn't I, I have this as an option? So there was a real desire for something that laid things out clearly like this. Um, 
Yes, and then some comments about the in NHS and out of NHS distinction, which which I think absolutely needs to be thought about today. Um, and uh, additionally, yeah, I think at, at this um, at this clinic, it might have been uh, suggested that young people comment on what they think would be a better distinction. So in this case, um, a young person explained that an alternative name might be in the community. So something to think about, especially in the activity uh, going forward. So on the next page, um, this is just to tell you a little bit about what's going on currently with the iThrive Grids. Um, so uh, for, for uh, those who don't read Arabic, uh, including me, uh, this is the iThrive Grid and uh, the low mood iThrive Grid in, in Arabic. So we have, um, there was a lot of demand to create some uh, translations of the grid. So we've managed to do that with this, uh, with this one and also with the out of NHS grid. And there's also ongoing academy module training delivery um, by myself and the team that's been sort of ticking along during the uh, during the pandemic. We've moved to online now um, and continue to deliver those trainings. And then the next slide wanted to mention I saw Freddie's in this uh, in in this group as well. So um, not to call you out, Freddie, but uh, but so Freddie and I have been working uh, on a on a separate project. Um, at the Tavistock, and it's uh, it, it is the development of a new web-based platform. Uh, you may have heard about it a little bit uh, if you work at uh, in NCL or in in the Tavistock, so that's North Central London. Um, and uh, so right now we're thinking of calling it um, NCL Waiting Room. And the sort of purpose of this platform is to provide sort of sources of help or support and information, you know, right from the point that young people are referred into uh, a CAMS service. Uh, and so the idea is to have, instead of just having to wait for support and only receiving support once you come into a clinic, this is sort of a, a waiting room to have some of the information right up front. And it's uh, got lots of interesting features, which um, if you're interested in it, definitely get in contact with me or, or with Freddie Peel, who's leading on this project um, at the Tavistock. But the the, the relevance of this uh, to the iThrive Grids is that this may be a future home for the iThrive Grids, because as we've all moved to online means of sort of interacting with people and clinicians have been doing therapy sessions online, uh, this is a, a sort of an opportunity to Oh, Rachel, that's great. I see your comment. Um, I, I'm sure I'll share or sh I'll share my email address and um, and Freddie's as well. We have actually we have a wait um, an NCL waiting room um, email address that I can share with you. And uh, yeah, so I think the relevance of this to the Ithra grids then is that they may live on this platform and it could be potentially used during sessions um, rather than just having to bring up a PDF of the grids. You could facilitate the conversations with a, with a young person or a parent um, online using this platform, looking at the different support options, and it might be a, a bit more of a user-friendly uh, experience. So moving on to the next slide. I think there's one. Oh, perfect. And I can see now it is time for comfort break. Um, so and right on time as well. So I think we have five minutes. Is that right, Rachel? That's absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. So we're very aware that that was um, a lot of talking and a lot of information sharing. So I wanted to just give you um, five minutes to do as many star jumps as you can, uh, because we want you energised for joining the workshop. And I hope that doesn't mean that people will just disappear at this point in time, because this is the bit that we do together to really help us to think about what we need to change around the grids to make them applicable to integrated care systems. So um, uh, what I just wanted to check, Rose, uh, is are the grids in people's um, diary invites so they can be having a look at those um, while they're in the comfort break? Or are we purely going to see them on the Miro board? They're not in there yet. I'm just going to quickly do it now. I just, because I was showing my screen, I couldn't do it, but I'll do it now. So um, within okay. a minute or so, they'll but be yeah. in there. Um, so we'll, if you take a few minutes, everybody, please do return. Uh, we really want this to be a collaborative um, process and uh, your thoughts will be very much appreciated. So we'll start back again at three and um, your, you will see in your diary invite, if you go to your Outlook invite or whatever mechanism you have your diaries in, um, then please do just have a look at the grids while people are taking that very brief break and we'll see you at three o'clock. Thanks very much. Okay, 
Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, Rosa, I think that you're going to lead us through the Miro activity, aren't you? So I shall hand over to you. Um, and uh, sorry, I just saw there's a, some. Um, so in the in the chat, uh, hopefully, Rachel, you'll have seen um, that there's the feedback from Freddie and Rosa in relation to connecting about the um, MCL waiting room. And thanks very much, Gail, um, for your feedback. Um, we we'll look forward to this next stage. Thanks all. Great. That's great to see everybody stuck around too. So, um, so uh, the next bit of this is going to be something completely different, which is a bit of a practical activity. So um, this, um, so you won't um, need to do this sort of in, in groups or anything, but what we thought is, um, so everybody, well, basically, it's going to be a Miro activity, um, and uh, I'm wondering is so how many people just by a show of hands have used Miro before? Um, like, in you can do the little hand button on there. Oh, I see Freddie. Yeah, Tosin, great. Um, a few few people have. Yeah, I see. Is it Gaia or or is that how you pronounce your name? I can I can. You see doing really well. It's Gaia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Um, I see you have it before, and that's absolutely fine. Um, the, some of the feedback we've gotten is that it, it is quite intuitive, if, if a little bit confusing at the beginning, but we'll do a little practice activity so everybody has a chance to sort of get an idea of what to do. So, um, so some people have used it, some people haven't, but that's absolutely fine. So um, first thing we'll do then is this is what the mirror board is going to look like. So what we, uh, Rose, could you share the link to this board? The first thing we'll ask everybody to do is to go to this board from the link, which should be shared in the chat in just a second. Um, there it is. Great. Okay, so click on this link and then I should be able to see some people coming in in a sec onto this board. Ah, yes, I see them already. Okay, so as people are filtering in, um, I wanna say if anybody is having any difficulties with Miro, um, that, that's completely normal. And um, do just let us know in the chat and, and mention what your difficulty is. And members of the iThrive team will be able to help you with that, um, either in like a little breakout room or um, by answering your question in the chat. Um, so I see people coming in. So we'll let, we'll let some more people come in. Oh, there we go. Great. Give it a few more seconds. So yeah, when you as you're coming in, have a look around. You'll see kind of some of the stuff that's on here already. Um, I see a lot of people are already here at this first practice task window, and I will just bring everybody to me. There we go. So that's one of the functions that is really helpful with Miro is that whoever's leading a task can sort of bring uh, everybody who's looking at the board to them. Um, and right, so is there anybody who's having any difficulties getting onto there? Do let us know in the chat if you are having any difficulties, but I'll go ahead in the interest of time and introduce the first activity. Um, right, so uh, the first activity is going to be this practice task, and this is just to get to grips with Miro a little bit. Um, there's a whole lot of different workspaces here, um, but what I'm going to ask you to do is, um, after I explain the task, just find a workspace uh, and fill in your details on there. It doesn't matter where it is. You can pick one of the ones down at the bottom if you want. Um, and so looking at this person one pra practice task, uh, one here. Um, so it's going to ask you for your name, your organization, and your role. Um, and then for task one, uh, I'll ask you to arrange the numbers below in order from left to right, dragging and dropping the post-its into the correct order, and uh, to delete any extra numbers that you see in there, um, and then to add in a post-it note with number seven, and then to change the colors to your favorite colors or color or colors uh, of the post-it notes. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of how Miro works, and this is the only skills that you'll need to have for the next task. So um, 
in general, in Miro, you can kind of drag and drop things. Um, your toolbar is along the left hand side here. Post it note is the little sticky note thing you'll probably see over on the left hand side. Um, so go ahead and pick a, a board now for you. So, like one of the sections, I can see some people have already done that, which is great. You should be able to see other people's floating cursors around. So, you may, may have to fight over a board for a second here or a little, I keep saying board, but a little workspace. Um, and once you've found one, go ahead and put your name on there so you kind of stake your claim to that one. Um, and then go ahead and start the task. So we'll give you, we'll give you, I think, 10 minutes for this first task, just to have a go with Miro to troubleshoot. Um, and let us know as well in the chat when you're done or if you have any difficulties with it as well. And we'll, we'll try to help out. So good luck. Just to say too, if anybody is yeah, and if anybody is is having difficulties and and they aren't able to solve them in the breakout room, um, if you can see the board on uh, on the Zoom, you'll be able to kind of see what people are doing. And um, when we move on to the next task, um, you can even write the options down on a piece of paper and do it do it yourself, uh, sort of paper based, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but in terms of like having it so everybody can see it and recording it and having it on Miro, I think it's useful if we can use the, the Miro board, but I'm aware some people won't be able to. Great, I'm seeing lots of people floating around here. Excellent. Seeing lots of post notes being changed. Someone's gone for rainbows, which I like. <laughs> this is great. This is great. This is the first one I've ever um, been on the hosting side of. So it's nice to see everybody's cursors moving around. I see some comments on here. Ooh. Yes. So in terms of doing the colors, um, if you um, click on the post-it note um, and then look up at the top right above the post-it note there should be a toolbar that pops up and it will have the color the fill color of that post-it note there above it and then if you click on that it should give you all the options that you can choose um not a huge range of options actually but um got a few different colors you can choose there the colors bit is not not the most important it looks like everybody's getting the most important bit which is just that dragging dropping and the deleting as well of things that they don't Think are important and also i can see a lot of people have added in a number seven without much difficulty just to say as well too you can use um you can use your regular sort of functions like control c and control v you can highlight things that it works a lot like word really so or powerpoint more like powerpoint i'd say um it does take a little while to get kind of comfortable with it and to get your get your ducks in a row i guess Okay, I see Rachel's son, R Rachel, Rachel too. <laughs> um, and the other Rachel is done as well. <laughs> uh, great. Okay. So I think we can probably go ahead and move on to the main task then, um, which we will have some time, some more time to work on. Um, just to say as well, keep using the chat if you have anything that you're stuck on or that you want help with. But in the interest of time, let's move on to this main task. So have a look at your board that you're on right now and uh, and figure out what number you are on that board. So it should say it at the top of your little um, workspace um, person and then number practice task and then find the corresponding number over here in this area. So I'll bring everybody to me to show you the area I'm talking about. Uh, it's just over on the right side. Here we go. Sorry, everybody, that's going to bring you all over here. You can go back if you want, but um, this is the main task here. So have a look at your um, your number and find your corresponding um, board. I can see everybody's doing that. That's great. Okay, so I'll go ahead and introduce you to this task then. So this is the main task for today. Uh, and so I have completely unceremoniously stolen this from some of the work that Freddie and I have been doing. So uh, if you have been involved in any of that work, this might look familiar. And this is sort of following on from kind of the way that um, 
techie type people do sprints and stuff, design sprints. Um, but we've, we've, we've made it quite um, straightforward here, I think. Um, so for um, so for this task, uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, look at the first uh, purple um, box. And so as I discussed earlier, the I3 grids, they currently divide helper support by in NHS and out of NHS. And we know that the health and care landscape has changed since the I3 grids were developed. So, and we've also had a lot of feedback that has said that this distinction no longer holds up and that we need to find a new way to separate the sources of helper support that are listed for each presenting difficulty. Um, and the task is going to be to take some time to think about how helper support options for low mood could be meaningfully grouped. Uh, and this is this is using any 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 sort of cumulative knowledge you have from from work that you've done, and just sort of thinking about how these different things could be categorized here. Um, then once you've had a second to think about that, arrange or cluster the helper support options from the low mood grids, which are listed below, um, into two or more categories. So once you've done that, place a post-it note above each cluster and write the name of the category on it. Um, so you can do more than one, it doesn't have to be two, um, but at least two categories. Um, so yeah, so that's the task. And uh, I see everybody's kind of found their workspaces as well. So you can uh, you can go over to those if you'd like and, uh, and have at it. So we have until, um, let's see. Yes, so let's let's do 10 minutes and then we'll check in and see how people are getting on. And Rose, um, maybe for people who, if anybody isn't able to use Miro right now, would you be able to share the board and then just focus in on one of the work um, spaces that's not being used? And then if you want, you can go and you can look at these options here and write, you could write them down on a piece of paper if you want, or you could sort of think about how they could be meaningfully grouped um, in whatever way works for you. And we'll, we'll bring you in as well after this task is over. I see Alex has a question about coloring. Um, for this, you don't have to color them if, if, uh, if, if it's too tricky, um, but the way I'd recommend to do it is whatever the box is that's already there, you just click on the box um, and it should come up with a bar above it with the option to click on a little circle that has color in it, like whatever the color of the, the item is that you're clicking on. And then you should see a drop down of all the different options that you have. And if you click on one of those, it will change, it should change the color. But don't worry if you, if you can't get it, that's fine. I really like some of these distinctions I'm seeing already. These are, you guys are, are nailing this task. So well done. If you find that you you finished the task already, which is absolutely fine if you haven't, but if, if you have finished it, have a think or even write down if you want, maybe some of your justification for why, why you've chosen these different options and kind of your thinking behind that. Because the next task is going to be voting on these different ones. So we'll, we'll have a look at them and, and see which ones we like the best. So if you, if you wanna write down some of your thinking, even like in a little post-it note or just to have it in your head for yourself and um, kind of why you've decided to separate it this particular way. A couple more minutes for people to finish up, I think. You can see people are still doing a little bit of work. Most people are kind of coming to a, coming to a close here. Great. You can see people are putting their post-it notes with the descriptions above their options. That's wonderful. Definitely give them a category so that we know kind of what's going on there, what your thinking is. Uh, you can see we're just finishing up now. Ooh, I can see some creative design things going on here too. This is lovely. This is one of the things I really like about Miro is that it's, um, I'm not like a paid advertiser for Miro or anything, <laughs> but um, it is a nice way to sort of show things visually and um, you can be a bit creative with it if you like. Okay, so while you're putting the final touches uh, on your uh, on your workspace, I'll give you the next task. So the final sort of bit of this uh, activity today, what I'm gonna invite you to do is if you're on Miro to um, 
have a look at other people's uh, things that they put and the way the, the categories that they uh, put on there and vote for your favorite one. So the way that you can do that, you have three votes each. They're um, shown by these little dots that are up here. I'll come, I'll come show you on this person. I'll bring you all to me really quickly so you can see. Um, right, so it's these little dots here on everybody's workspace. These should be drag and droppable. So um, you can vote for yourself if you want, that's absolutely fine. Um, but the other two votes vote for uh, two other um, uh, ones that you think are a good way of separating the, or, or creative or interesting way of separating out these options. And what you can do is you can just drag and drop them right into the box, the other person's box. Um, and so I'll give you, I give everybody five minutes in the first instance to vote, but if you need more time, that's absolutely fine. Um, and yeah, go ahead. Have a go with it. Should be able to see the ones that are actually worked on, um, because the the other there are going to be quite a few that are uh, that haven't been worked on. You can just ignore those for now. I can actually probably go through and delete those ones, so it's a bit easier. Ooh, I see some people are voting. Great, well done. Yep, just drop them in there, drop them on top of people's stuff, that's fine. Yeah. Probably need more than five minutes anyway to have a look at what other people have done too, so. Just have a mosey around the board. Ah, that's, I can see Chantal is having a bit of trouble and that's absolutely fine, don't worry. If you can just have a look around at the different boards and see um, at the different, at what people have put and you can vote, you can put your vote into the chat if you'd like. So um, let us know the, the numbers of the, of the ones that you'd like to vote for and we'll add those votes in for you. Right, so we can move on to the final uh, task uh, involving Miro, well, final task of this workshop really. Um, so we've all voted. You had a look at what everybody else has been saying. Um, maybe you found some that were similar to what you were thinking as well or different. Um, so I can see several of them have gotten some really, gotten a lot of dots. So although they are pretty well spread out through here, it looks like. So what I'm going to do, and uh, don't feel like you have to put your camera on, but what I'm going to ask is that you do as I call on you, if you put your audio on and just tell us um, why you chose to separate them out in this way and kind of what your thinking was, maybe just give us uh, like a one minute pitch on kind of what your thinking was and what and, and kind of how you found this process. So I'm gonna pick the, the three that I see with the most votes at the minute. Um, so let's have a look through. Right, so I can see Person eight has a lot of votes here. So I'll bring everybody to me so you can see person eight. Um, right, here we go. Um, so person eight, could you introduce yourself and, uh, and unmute yourself and let us know uh, well, how did you find this process and can you tell us a bit about your thinking? See. Hey, oh, sorry, hey. that's struggling sorry. to find unmute. Hey, that was me. Um, thinking was, um, I found it quite hard to categorize it. And so, even though we've been thinking about this, <laughs> um, and so I was just thinking about like how I make decisions at the moment. And it tends to be on when I can do something or when, uh, when I've got the space to do it or if I feel like I'm ready right now I need some prep and so I thought one simple-ish way might be just an ordering of how quickly you can access something um, and then after just the last thought I'll throw in is after I saw the blobs it occurred to me it might be more like a kind of Gantt chart of there might be CBT that online CBT that you could do right now that sort of you can act self-serve but there might also be one that's all the way down the other end that I need to go through a clinician to access first. So it might be sort of overlapping oblongs instead of blobs. Very interesting. I think you got the most votes actually. So well done. And uh, yeah, interesting to see that the sort of the time uh, separation here. And I also like all the colors well done. It's like you've used Miro before, Freddie. <laughs> um, 
Great. Um, so we'll go on to the next person. Um, so, gosh, lots, lots of even very evenly spread votes here. Um, so I will ask person ten to introduce their ideas and their thinking. I think ten was me. Um, my thinking was when I looked at these options, was that some, the ones that stood out were some were real time with a live person. I think that's what I was differentiating in my head, real time with a live person. So, so that was my middle block. And then there were quite a few that were self-directed or that somebody would have to initiate or is that in their time when they wanted to access that resource. And then the medical antidepressants, I was a bit stuck. I didn't know where that fit. So I put that one on its own with the health and medical support. <laughs> I think it's great that you went for three categories as well, too. It's quite interesting. And, and um, yeah, no, I, I really I really like these categories as well. So and Possibly, actually, that, that antidepressant could go in the real time with the person, with the professional. So, yeah. But I, in my head, it was more medical. So I was separating it out compared to the more... Take your own initiative. Absolutely, absolutely. Great, well done. And uh, let's see, who will we pick to do the last one? So looking around, I wanna make sure I'm seeing every board. Who do we, who should we pick next? Okay, there might be some ties in here, but I think I'll just pick um, the one that I'm looking at right now is person 11 and I, do shout out in the in the chat if I've, I've, I've missed somebody who had loads that of was me. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Let's hear it. Oh, Rachel, of all people. <laughs> I just, we'll do I someone just, else too. We'll, we'll get someone else as well. Yeah, I'll keep it brief because I was okay. just really pleased that I could actually use Miro for once. And I'm the one who stole Freddie's uh, <laughs> post it in the first one. But uh, my rationale was actually very similar to Rachel's thinking about um, the things that I could do myself but I, I like it's a bit of in my mind it's a bit of a combination of Rachel's and Freddie's because it's the things that I can do myself and potentially right now and then the things that I can do in my community or um, and I suppose I did separate out community support and peer support and I suppose that's where it's opening up it makes you just think about um, you know uh, how we might enable people to think about a, a more holistic offer in each of these different domains but that was my thinking so help or support from a trained practitioner I was trying to move away from health because that's a lot of the feedback that it could be somebody in a school setting or it could be a faith leader or um uh, it, could, it could be anybody that actually is trained in mental health so thinking about the broader um context that children and young people are in um that was why I just changed it to trained practitioner and um yeah, the, I can't quite read what I wrote. Um, sorry, I need to zoom in a bit. But um, yeah, help or support in the community and things I can do myself with, with my friends or with my family. So it might be that, um, you know, it's a peer group um, that is supported to develop, um, you know, practical strategies as well as, you know, family members knowing about reading support because it could be parents and carers. It might not be the young person themselves. Mm. Interesting. And it's totally different from the other ones, too. It's so interesting to see these different ways of doing it. I suspected that there would be lots of different ways. I can see, um, have I, so I don't think I've invited person 13 yet to, to do their presentation, have I? Hi. Hi. Could you, would you mind also sharing yours? Because I can see. Okay. Um, so, I think my so I'm a commissioner in terms of my day-to-day -day role. And some of the work that we're doing locally is looking at redesigning our sort of local CAM system. So I think when I look at these things, I'm very much thinking with my redesign program brain on and thinking about um, sort of having that really robust self-help and support for people. So, um, we have quite a lot available in Hertfordshire, for example, but people aren't necessarily aware that, that it's there to support. So I think I'm thinking around that sort of promotion of that telephone support and what, what reading materials are available for people to help self-manage and then looking in terms of sort of localized community support thinking about primary care networks etc and then the support in terms of those um 
more sort of NHS commissioned medical lives sort of services, I suppose. That was just my thinking, high level, I suppose. Great. Yeah, it looks really great. I, I like this distinction a lot here. So well done. And well done, everybody, too, for doing this. And I wanted to um, ask that anybody who um, wasn't able to vote or wasn't able to do the Miro task, do you want to chime in and share now some of your thoughts or any reflections or anything that you um, you were thinking differently about or you don't have to, but just if you just if anybody wants a chance to sort of discuss their their thinking. Maybe some of these lined up with what what you what you put as well. I see Rachel's hands is up. Go ahead, Rachel. Um, one thing I was thinking was um, the how we manage it without making it seem like a linear progression. So um, obviously a focus on moving away from a, a tiered uh, approach to help and support. And that actually um, what will be really important is to think about how people can make active choices. So, for example, you know, the, the waiting room element that people can be using um, some resources whilst they might have also made a decision to get support from a trained practitioner and how we bring that alive so that it's not one or the other, um, but that people can opt into different types of help and support that best fits with their needs. Absolutely, absolutely. Freddie, I can see your, your hands up now, go ahead. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of this until until just now, but um, connected to what Rachel just said, I think, um, you know, we're used to buying things and being able to sort online, uh, you know, cheapest, latest, most popular, changing the order of the products. And so that's kind of one way of saying there is no one order, you know, it depends how you look at it. So my time is of the essence thing could be one way of sorting it. It could be I don't want to ever see someone and I'm happy to spend all the time with someone. So is it more personal or, or, or transactional or something like that? Um, so it could be different sort, sorting mechanisms if it was um, different ways of looking at it and prioritizing it. Mm, absolutely. Um, and I think uh, what you've reminded me of, Freddie, which I haven't said yet, is that um, what we want to do, I think, and Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the next step really is going to be to take some of these ideas of different ways uh, of, of showing these options and uh, take them from this group and show them to some young people um, and to get their feedback on it as well. And, um, and if they would arrange them any different way, but I completely agree that there are lots of good ways and maybe they would be, maybe certain situations, they would, they would be more helpful in one format and then other ones in another format. And that's kind of where this uh, having the grids available online, whether it's really, or like on a platform or something like that, you could be more flexible with the, with the distinctions. So go ahead, uh, Rachel, did you want to say something or? Oh, okay. Alex, I see your hands up. Go, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, looking at like the categories and stuff, um, part of my role, I'm what's called a Thrive Navigator. So I sort of like take referrals and I make sure working with the family, um, you know, that shared decision-making and we discuss with the wider community. And sometimes it's, we dip into both so that there'll be some like talking therapy um, and that that'll be provided within the uh, like counseling within the community but they're also quite practical so it's not just a one size fits all uh, you know like one one mode of sort of support or help so that it dips into both um, but yeah that's just my experience of, of it. That's a great point, Alex, and thanks for thanks for sharing that. I, I wonder if there were any other comments um, from <clears throat> people who haven't shared yet about their experiences kind of in relationship to these different kinds of support services, um, support or help, for instance. Anybody we haven't heard from yet? Not to worry if not to, we may have reached a natural sort of finishing point here. And I think the next step uh, is going to be like, like I mentioned, to take this, have young people have a look at it, see what they think um, and uh, continue to sort of think about how these grids are going to, to look in the future. But um, before I turn it over to, to Rachel, I think, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much and thanks for diving into this and uh, doing something uh, 
new for many and different and uh, well done with all of your different categorizations and we appreciate your your help with this so um yeah over to you rachel well, i think i also want to say rosa a huge thank you to you for setting up and coordinating that workshop because um as you know i i'm not the most uh skilled in digital enabling and actually for even i to be able to uh use Miro with your intro session um you know is testament to your hard work so really thank you and thank you for everybody's um contributions um it was really yeah as Freddie said really interesting and great to have the different thoughts uh from everybody who's participated today so if you want to um give any additional thoughts then please do share them with the um thrive program team so the email address is actually there on the, that next slide and um, so if you have any thoughts after today's session as well you know often a lot of the thinking happens you know <laughs> overnight um so you know it might be that you think of something and please do share it don't just hold on to it but you know please do let us know any thoughts that it, it brings to your mind okay so just to uh, summarize the next steps then uh, we have some training available to support practitioners in using the itrab grids to support shared decision making training that we're going to be delivering in february and we're putting that out to the community of practice uh, so you're going you're getting uh, the first dibs on that information so it's going to be a remote delivery for that workshop and you can email to get the information about that but it will also be shared with the community of practice monthly newsletter so you can circulate it across your teams if you would like to train up um, professionals across the sectors in using the thrive grids to support shared decision making there's a couple of well, there's a typo on that slide so uh, um, if you would like if you're not currently a member of the community of practice do join it um, we can only sign people up to the community of practice if they um, proactively ask us to because of gdpr so we do need you to email ithriveinfo at tavi-port.nhs um, to be able to be sent that information through the newsletters so please do make use of that um, okay now as ever um, feedback is important to us both in terms of helping us get the feedback on your experience of today's session but also in thinking about how we can improve our work and certainly the work of the community of practice across the country so if you wouldn't mind please just go into www.mentit.com um, and enter the code that was on the screen just then and um, has been put into the chat so um, if you didn't quite catch it um, I'll just copy it uh, actually I can't do it it's 79193230 so you go to mentit.com on your browser and put in uh, that code perhaps if we put the code into the chat um, Rose need need audience pace on Mentit okay hmm. It needs a presenter to move the next slide on. Okay, um, Rose, could you just put the code in the uh, Menti? Okay, yeah, there we go. So we'll just let people join because I don't, um, Rachel, you were obviously quick off the mark there. Um, we'll just let a few more, if we move it on, we can't um, get everybody's vote. So um, we'll just give people a, a couple of minutes to to log in and share their thinking about how they found today's workshop. That's great, people taking the time. Thank you very much. It is important to us to get get the feedback. Sounds like from from that that most people who are here have found it at least a bit helpful so far. You know, we're very happy to have constructive feedback so if it's not been helpful to you please do also let us know um but really really good to know that um the vast majority of people have found it helpful that's so just loiter for oh yeah no we're moving on great um could you so this um i'm thinking is probably a, a free type so i think you have about 250 characters you can share your key takeaways from today's session so it's any thoughts that you have that you're going to take away. Yeah, you just have to type that into 
uh, the box, hopefully. When people start to post them, we'll be able to check that it is actually working. So, ah, great. How important it is to share as a community of practice. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thinking about how we're bringing people together to collaborate on these challenges and ensuring that they're genuinely applicable to the wider systems we're working in. Using I Thrive grids with, within clinical practice. Using the grids to encourage children and young people aware of the options. So yeah, that's about um, shifting that power. Um, So do please um, continue to uh, move in the power to being in the hands of children and young people. Community and social prescribing is an equal choice. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's a helpful reminder that we know uh, from the evidence base that specialist interventions don't work for everybody. And um, what we do know is that actually if people make active choices about the type of help or support they choose to engage in, the there is a more greater likelihood of positive outcomes, that's really helpful. Empowering the children and families that we work with. Um, it's not always about therapy and medication. And collaboration as an action facilitated by the grids. Lovely, great, thank you. Okay, so if you've got any comments, please please keep them coming. I don't know if, do we have any? Rachel, you're trying to understand and learn more about social prescribing would be helpful to chat with Gaia. Yeah, great, so making links. Of course, traditionally we did these um, community practice events in the room where people would make those very proactive links, but yeah, thank you, Rachel, to make that connection with Gaia. Okay, so um, the next question is, yes, whether anybody has any suggestions for future community practice workshops. So yeah, okay, great. So. Similar collaborative workshops on tackling common challenges that different sites struggle with. I wonder if social prescribing is one of those and Gaia, whether that might be something you'd be keen to, to help us think about in a community of practice event. Maybe we could follow that up with you as well, um, if there's appetite. And also thinking about our colleagues in NHS England that we work with uh, um, might be helpful if that's an area of interest. Yes, please, to social prescribing. Okay, Rachel, that's great, thank you. And close in. Okay, so obviously we, we always look at these things through the lens of the Thrive Framework, so how social prescribing aligns with the Thrive Frameworks of the system change. Great, okay. Thanks, Gail. We'll be coming to you <laughs> um, to think more with you about that. Fantastic. But please, yeah, think about any other areas. So uh, the note and vote together alone approach was great. Actually gave me a, think, a minute to think about the challenge instead of jumping to an answer. <laughs> Focus on principle, what it looks like in action. That's interesting, yeah, taking each of the different Thrive principles individually. Okay, really helpful ideas. So keep those coming. And, uh, you know, I think we can keep this final question um, or opportunity for feedback open beyond the uh, workshop. So please do add any additional comments and we'll absolutely collect those and make use of them. So, um, I'm, I'm aware that we agreed to finish by four and um, just want to acknowledge and thank our speakers. So Nikita Fopel and Rosa Town for their um, brilliant overviews of both the personalization agenda and shared decision-making and the iTrive grids. And then obviously the, the um, work on Miro there, which everybody contributed to. So um, you know, absolutely big thank you for everyone for their participation. Now, if anybody has any further questions uh, that they'd like to ask before we finish, please do feel free to come off um, or put your cameras on and uh, ask any questions um, or share any thoughts. Um, and in the absence of any, we could, we could draw um, this session to a close. Any thoughts? More questions from anybody?
No, okay, great. Well, I'll just give everybody a big round, round of applause for contributions in various ways and uh, to Rose particularly for navigating as well behind the scenes. Um, thank you all very much. All right, so um, goodbye and good luck with thinking about how you might uh, support the implementation of uh, shared decision making in your practice and do hold in mind that I thrive grid training in February, which will be shared in the community practice. Okay, thanks all. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye bye. bye.